Our first speaker is uh, Reverend Dr. Dale Meyer, who is the 10th president of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, a post that he's held since 2004. Following his graduation from Concordia Seminary, Dale served as parish pastor in uh, Illinois from 1974 through 81. And in 1981, he accepted the call to Concordia Seminary, serving as professor in the areas of homiletics and literature. Dale was a speaker on the Lutheran Hour radio program from 1989 to 2001, and during that same tenure, he hosted the national television show On Main Street. Conducted in a talk show format, Dale engaged his guests in relevant topics concerning Christians, the Christian church, and the culture. In 2001, Lutheran Hour Ministries received two prestigious Emmy Awards, from the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Science for two episodes of On Main Street. In 2001, Dale rejoined Concordia Seminary faculty and continues to serve as a professor of practical theology in in addition to his role as president of the school. Dale has served the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod and the church at large over the years in a variety of capacities. They include the third vice president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod from 95 to 98. He was a member of the standing committee on pastoral ministry for the Missouri Synod and served on the board of trustees of the American Bible Society from 2001 through 2013. He has written numerous sermons and columns for Lutheran Hour Ministries. He's contributed to the periodical issues in Christian education and is also a regular contributor to Concordia Journal. His articles include A Church Caught in the Middle, An Urban Seminary, and Why Go to Church. My people ask that every Sunday. (laughs) Dale has published devotionals, both in the online and book format, and he encourages Christians daily in their faith walk with Jesus. His areas of interest include the study of St. Peter's first epistle, Sabbath applied to life today, and important for us is his interest in the church in a changing culture. He speaks to us today under his theme, Why Your Congregation is More Important Than Ever. Join me in welcoming Dale Meyer. Thank you, Randy, for those kind words. Only my mother would believe what you said. It is good to be here. I... um, get myself arranged. Yeah, I thank you for the invitation to be here. You can hear me in the back? Forgive me, those of you who have had to sit through my presentations before, but I was doing a Lutheran Hour rally one time, and I asked, can you hear me in the back? And they said, if I wanted to hear you, I would have sat in the front. <laughs> it's good to see Mark Chesky. Uh, you always have a smile, and I remember when people would compare the two of us, they said, I had the face for radio. <laughs> I have plenty of material for these next 45 minutes or so, and there are three parts of the material. First of all, in your packet, there are six pages, I believe, of quotations, okay? Okay. And you might want to have that out and do whatever note-taking you do on that packet of quotations. We will not deal with all the quotations. Um, You'll see some of them have been put in twice. That's because I did my own typing. (laughs) This is why we have executive assistants. So the quotations will substantiate what I'll be trying to say. Secondly, you have the screen. Yeah. And and the the screenshots are simply the headings for where we're at in the presentation. But thirdly and mainly, you know, just follow me. And I'll try and be clear. Uh, Thank you to the Siebert Foundation uh, for the invitation. And thanks to the Siebert Foundation also for giving us at Concordia Seminary some years ago a grant. And this was a grant that enabled us to give our students 
congregational immersion experiences. So we would take some of our seminary students and, and put them in, in places that are not typical churches, typical church settings. For example, a, a, a congregation in rural Nebraska in the middle of no place that has 300 a week in worship, and they're coming from all over, and the average age is in the 30s. That doesn't represent a lot of the congregations in our, in our denominations. So this, for me and for our students, has been a transformational grant, and we thank you very, very much for it. I enjoyed going on some of those immersion trips, and, and I learned as much as our students did. Greetings from Concordia Seminary. Concordia Seminary started in 1839. This is a replica of the first seminary building. It's, it's just for decoration right now, except when I offend my wife and she makes me sleep out in the log cabin. Things have changed over the years. Um, this is the campus that was uh, constructed in 1926. So it's an old campus, and we've been privileged to be able to update the grand old campus, and construction projects are always going on. This year, we have 615 students, which is down from the peak years when churches were thriving in the United States. But in the world of seminaries, there are 270 seminaries that are credited by the ATS, the Association of Theological Schools, uh, we're a big school. We are a big seminary. But things have changed over the years, from the time of the log cabin to where we're at today. And that's what we want to talk about. And hopefully I will give you things to think about. Your congregation is more important than ever. It's always been important, but there are 21st century reasons that did not obtain in the 20th century that should really energize us for the work of the local congregation. I was preaching about two years ago in Asheville, North Carolina. And this congregation has a school. Most of the students are not Lutheran. It has a faithful, dedicated pastor, but the congregation that worshiped on Sunday looked like a lot of the congregations that I get into, it was old and white. My sermon theme was, it's a great time to be the church. So afterwards, during the coffee and fellowship hour, an elderly lady sidled up to me and she said, how can you say it's a great time to be the church? And I knew where she was coming from because you can sense the spirit and health of a congregation when you go in, even though you don't live there and know all the details, you can usually get a sense of, of, of how things are going. So how can you say that it's a great time to be the church? Well, there are a number of reasons why I believe that. And I'll share some of them in the next minutes. But ultimately, it's a faith statement. This is the church of Jesus Christ. How would we say that this is not a good time to be the church? I don't get it. Oswald Chambers, in one of his devotions, I think it's in February, says uh, that dejection in spiritual matters is always wrong. I just don't picture appearing before the Lord Jesus in judgment and saying, you know, it was a bummer being in your church in that early 21st century. <laughs> and this is a motto, uh, an attitude that, that we instill in our, in our students at the seminary. It is a great time to be the church. However, when that elderly woman questioned that, I knew where she was coming from. And let me just lay out a couple things that have changed during many of our lifetimes. 
Um, some of you are dyeing your hair gray. Very becoming. And what we have seen in our time is the, the change from Christian America to what we have today. So I was born in 1947 at Harvey, Illinois, at the Protestant Hospital, because the hospital in our town was used by the Catholics pretty much, okay? It was a different world. And I grew up in, quote, Christian America. Everyone knew that they should go to church on Sunday. Now, whether they went or not, that's, that's another question, okay? In Christian America, everyone was fairly literate when it came to the Bible and its stories and characters. Whether they read the Bible or not, you know, I don't know. Some did, some did. Uh, in Christian America that many of us grew up in, people knew the message of the church about Jesus. Again, whether they believed it or not, that's, that's another thing. But we're talking about a, a public culture that was nominally fairly Christian. And during those years, the Judeo-Christian morality dominated the mindset of the United States of America about how we are supposed to act toward and with one another. It's Christian America. That's all changed. It's gone. And it's not coming back in any of our lifetimes. And I mean those of us who have gray hair and those of you who do not have gray hair yet. Christian America is not coming back. In our time, things have, have gotten even tougher because of technology. Thomas Friedman, a few years ago, put out a book called Thank You for Being Late. And I'll mention the story that led to that title. But he looks at all the changes that have happened, especially since the year 2007. We think that these changes go back more than a few years, but in fact, Friedman shows that the, the, the real avalanche of technical change started in the year 2007, and he documents that. And Friedman talks about accelerations. So that the natural changes that you're going to have in any culture, in any time in the history of the world, are being accelerated by the instantaneous communication that we have in our day and age. If you look at the quotations, there is a quotation right at the top. The Christian America is gone, and that causes us cultural angst. Ray Kurzweil is quoted by Friedman. The 21st century will be equivalent to 20,000 years of progress at today's rate of progress. I don't know how he knows that, but I don't dispute it. And then Friedman himself. The rate of technological change is now accelerating so fast that it has risen above the average rate at which most people can absorb all these changes. Most of us can't keep pace anymore. And then he, he quotes a man named Teller. And this is causing us cultural angst. That's the truth. Whether it's that woman in Asheville or most of the people that we worship with and try and lead spiritually, this is a time of high cultural angst has been and it will continue to be. Uh, legacy businesses are flailing. They don't know how to make it in this new world. Think about Sears, Roebuck, and company. The government <clears throat> is dysfunctional at almost every level. My youngest daughter works for Senator Braun from Indiana. And, and, and she, and, and there are countless thousands of, of good people in Washington, D.C., but the story she tells makes me thankful to have gray hairs. The government, and we're seeing it now, is, is, is dysfunctional. 
the institutional church is in decline. I can't speak for other denominations, but when I was growing up, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod had 2.7 million members. It's interesting that President Rast of, of our partner seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, is a historian, and he, he has documented that the Missouri Synod grew in every decade since its beginning until 1970. Uh, one decade had 343% growth. A number of times it was in the 90s, the 60s. Every decade since 1837, there, there was growth. 1847, 1847. The seminary is older than the synod. There was growth until 1970 when things started going downhill. And he says that one of the reasons that it, it started going downhill was that we turned our focus inward upon ourselves rather than outward in mission. We'll talk about that more, more later. Um, Peggy Noonan described it, I think, very well in a Wall Street opinion piece a couple of years ago. And that's the third quotation on the first page of quotations. She had just reread a book by Dean Acheson. Acheson was the Secretary of State under Harry Truman after the war. And Acheson's book talked about the, the, the changes, you know, the tectonic changes, to use a familiar word, that happened at the end of World War II. And she applied it to today. Everyone's in the dark looking for the switch. I love that, you know? Being 72 years old, I have the right to get up in the middle of the night and fumble around looking for a, a special place that I need in the middle of the night. You know, where's the, where's the switch? Everyone's in the dark looking for the switch. When you're in the middle of history, the meaning of things is usually unclear. In real time, most things are obscure. And then she quotes Atchison. Only slowly did it dawn upon us that the whole world's structure and order that we had inherited from the 19th century was gone. We're living in that kind of a time now. There was a historian named Phyllis, I think it's Pickle. I've not read her, but I've, Tickle? Tickle, okay, some of you know her. And she said that every 500 years, the church has a garage sale. We're in the garage sale right now. Things have not changed in Western culture or the institutional church this much since the Reformation and the Enlightenment. And I find that rather invigorating for reasons that we will get into shortly. Everybody's in the dark looking for the switch. We're not. We're not, because we know who the light of the world is. We say it, and I think we all believe it. Although we quote Mark chapter 9, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus Christ makes this a good time for us to be in the church. And though we do not know what is ahead and how all these changes are going to come out, He's the Lord of the church. And we rely ultimately not on sight, but his promises. We do use our sight. We try and interpret the times and the seasons. But ultimately, this is the church of Jesus Christ. Not of Martin Luther, God love him. Not of your congregation or our seminary, God love it not of our programs or of our, of our denominations, and they do precious things. But this is the, the light of Jesus Christ shining in us and through us. So Christian America is gone, but I don't think that's, that's all bad. 
the times are complicated, but the theological understanding of what's going on is simple. Okay? I'll say that again. These are complicated times. I panicked yesterday as I was driving from Mitchell Field out here when I remembered I didn't bring my charger. Okay? Thanks to Diana Rash for uh, giving me a charge. Okay? Uh, how do I cope without my charger? Well, I Googled Best Buy and whatever, where can I go? You gotta have that. And, and that's just, you know, these, these are hard times to cope with. And more than chargers, there are moral, ethical uh, issues that, that we scratch our heads. What in the world are we gonna do about this? So that's complicated, and it's not gonna get any easier. But theologically, what we're going through now is very, very simple. On the negative side, what we're experiencing is basically a first commandment issue. Man is turned in on himself. The old expression from St. Augustine is incurvatus in se, turned in on ourselves in a fetal position. And we have turned away from the creator and the redeemer. And now we think that we can make it all on our own. A great book is by um, Heather Schott Davis. And this is on page one of your quotations. And her book is Man Turned In On Himself. And it, it, it's a simple book to read. I don't mean it's simplistic. But it's the kind of book that uh, in, in, in preparing Bible classes and sermons and lectures and what have you, it's an invaluable source of information. And she gives some symptoms of man turned in on himself. Promiscuity, consumerism, obesity, narcissism, apathy, greed. And then she describes chaos, each being God, because that's what it is. We're in a, we're in a Tower of Babel. Time. We don't need God. We're going to construct society as we choose. Each being God leads to chaos. Chaos bounces back to the modern man in the form of increasing anxiety and depression. And she cites statistics that show the increase in anxiety and depression. And those are very serious issues. I'm, and they require more than, than, than just a theological analysis. Distrust. Our self-centeredness turns our fellow man into our competition. Distrust. We see this all the time. Affinity in virtual communities. We therefore create safe and undemanding simulations of community for ourselves through technology. So on the negative side of these changes, we have as, as, as a whole and as a culture turned in on ourselves and away from the creator and the only one we believe who can, can redeem us. But here's the positive thing about this time. And this is, and I'm speaking personally now about what's positive. Because this changed time teaches us to focus anew or for the very first time on Jesus Christ. That's the positive part of this. So I grew up in <clears throat> Chicago Heights, Illinois, which is 211th Street South. It's as my wife says, Dale, you're not from Chicago, you're from Chicago land. And, and I went to St. Paul's Lutheran School uh, 180 students, 1950s, and then I went to Bloom Township High School, which was over 3,000 students, public high school. But you know what? In those days, the things of God and of the church and the public culture and life were homogenized. Eh? I always have to bring in some reference to milk. My dad was a milkman. And I would say then, it's okay, he married my mother. Students don't get the joke, <laughs> you know? 
I have a milk truck now that I'm being restored, having restored. It's costing me an arm and a leg to do it. I'm not even telling my wife how much it costs. But, but when it comes on campus in a couple of months, the students are going to say, what's that? You know, one generation to the next. So anyway, but back, back when a lot of us grew up, the things of the church and the things of our public culture were homogenized. And, and, and the sharp demarcations of faith were not seen. So when I go from little Lutheran school to the big public high school, those cultures were complementary. You know, they weren't the same. But we knew, and our parents and our church leaders knew that, yeah, Bloom is going to reinforce a lot that they learned at, at St. Paul's and vice versa. I'm not, that, it was a good time. I'm, I'm glad to have experienced Christian America, but it's gone, as I said. And now in these times, the centrality of Jesus Christ to what we do as church is very clear. Not Luther, not the congregation, not the synod, not whatever, and those things are all blessed, not to be despised. But this is about Jesus Christ. There's a, a, the president of the Pacific Southwest District of the LCMS years ago, Arnie Kuntz, said it this way. And he wrote, he wrote, he wrote this in a, a, a large print book of devotions. It was, it was called Devotions for the Chronologically Blessed. Got it? The Chronologically Blessed. And Kuntz said, life narrows down. And don't you know it, you know, whatever your age, the, the narrowing is experienced. And it's also true for the institutional church, for your congregation, for our seminary. Life narrows down and crisis comes. And suddenly only one thing matters. And there in the narrow place stands Jesus. The sooner we get that, the easier we'll be able to navigate these troubled times that we are in. So my thesis is this. In these changed times, your congregation is more important than ever. And acting on new opportunities can energize your gatherings and mission. I am not saying this to the neglect or the diminution of the word and the sacrament. From day one, God's people have gathered around the word of Christ and his sacraments. But in this 21st century time, there are additional reasons why the congregation is vital and has, has a, a ministry and mission unlike the days in Christian America. Let me get into some of these opportunities, at least the way I see them. What you and I are doing as leaders are helping parishioners out of Christian America. Now that especially applies to the older people who sit in our pew, who had the experience of growing up in Christian America. As, as leaders of the church, it's our job to lead them to this new time where we in very clearly see that the focus of faith is upon our Lord Jesus. Martin Charlemagne was a professor long ago at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, maybe not that long ago, but someplace he said that the job of a pastor is to interpret theology, to, to interpret reality theologically. To interpret reality theologically. And I think that's the first great opportunity that we have in this new day and time. I have an acquaintance in Germany, and he emailed me about a month ago, and he reminded me of something that apparently I said during my Lutheran hour life. And you know, whenever anybody quotes me, I get nervous, because I've said some really stupid things in my life. I think we all have, I, oh my gosh, what's gonna come? But Stefan, Stefan said that, apparently I had said that the church has answers to all the questions. All the questions that people were asking in 1950. 
Interpreting reality theologically means that we have to theologically analyze the questions that people are asking in 2019. We're helping parishioners out of Christian America and specifically to trust in the providence of God and to a lively hope in Jesus Christ, especially in his theology of the cross and the promise of glory. To repeat, we're helping parishioners out of Christian America so that they trust in God and have a lively hope in Jesus Christ, especially the theology of the cross and the hope of glory. Let me give you my analysis of, of where a lot of our churches are today. Bill Carr is a retired St. Louis Seminary professor. He, he taught Old Testament, great guy. And he retired to Virginia and has a garden. His grandchild, I don't remember if it's a boy or a girl, little, little grandchild was with him one day in the garden and said, Grandpa, what's that? He said, well, that's, that's a tomato. Grandpa, I know it's a tomato, but what's it on? That child, and I, I presume it's a church child, didn't know the tomatoes grow on plants. When you think that population in the United States is moving from small town and rural areas into metropolitan areas at a rapid pace, I venture to say that a lot of our young people do not know that tomatoes grow on vines, that meat comes from animals, that uh, clothing comes from cotton plants, and that everything in the world comes from soybeans. They don't know that. They don't know the world of the creator. It wasn't like that in the 50s. They don't know the world of the creator. How do we as adults function? I, I was sharing this message a few months ago in Iowa, where it is a rural agricultural Based crowd. And they chuckled at the tomato thing. But I said, let's think about ourselves. When you or I are ill, we go to the doctor. We also pray. Whose word do we really wait for? And when the doctor's word comes back that it's going to be okay, or you have to do this, that, or whatever, isn't that the word that we share with others? I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying that we rely on humans, maybe more than we rely on God to get us through whatever it is. I believe helped my unbelief. In that rural crowd in Iowa, <clears throat> I talked about agriculture. I said, okay. They had had serious flooding this year. I said, where do you go for the uh, forecasts in prayer to God or to the ag department? Where do you check how the prices are going to do, the commodity report or in your faith life? On and on and on. And then I got, I got off on something that just ticks me off, and this is just one of my eccentricities. Anheuser-Busch is running a, a commercial about barley. Maybe you've heard it. You know, how the farmer gets up early in the morning because he's growing the barley for our beer and how he loves his barley. I, I don't know, I'm not a farmer, I don't know why you have to get up early in the morning for barley. I mean, it's just... <laughs> um, <clears throat> so anyway, this commercial goes on and then it talks about the steady hand of the farmer as he guides his combine through the fields. That's bull roar. The GPS is, literally, the GPS steers the combine, and when he gets to the headland, he turns it around manually, lines it up, and the GPS takes it. The GPS 
drives the combine. The GPS um, tells how, how close to plant the rows and not the rows. The computer technology tells how wet the grain is. This is the kind of time we're living in. And so it raises the question, how much is Dale's life and how much are you in, in your secret times really dependent upon the creator and the sustainer? That's one of the treacherous things about this time of life, that assumptions that we have learned from little on about faith get undercut. If you look at the quotations, at the bottom is functional atheism. This is from Oz Guinness. The modern world quite literally manages without God. We can do so much, so well by ourselves, that there is no need for God, even in his church. Thus, we modern people can be profoundly secular in the midst of explicitly religious activities, which explains why so many modern Christian believers are atheists unawares, professing to be believers in supernatural realities. They are virtual atheists. Whatever they say they believe, they show in practice that they function without practical resource to the supernatural. I may be wrong, but I believe that that describes a lot of people who sit in our pews Sunday after Sunday. From Parker Palmer, a third shadow common among leaders, he's talking about church leaders, is functional atheism, the belief that ultimate responsibility for everything rests with us. This is the unconscious, unexamined conviction that if anything decent is going to happen here, we are the ones who must make it happen. A conviction held even by people who talk a good game about God. I can apply that to so many discussions that we have at the seminary. Probably discussions that you have in your congregation with the leadership. What are we going to do? What are we going to do about this? And I have, I have more than once said, let's just wait on the Lord and see how he unpacks that. And they look at me like a cow looking at a, a new fence. <laughs> there is some measure, God only knows, of functional atheism in our churches today. So this headline for this opportunity that we have is interpreting reality theologically. And what is compelling about the church's message? What is compelling about the church's message? Do we sometimes participate in functional atheism? I certainly do. And what is it that's going to make me see my utter dependence for Jesus. Even more than the church, my work, what makes me desperate for Jesus? Sitting, in a, sitting and listening to a sermon that says that you're a sinner and Jesus died for your sins doesn't do it for me. <laughs> and we believe that. But that doesn't communicate. So here's how I have tried to talk about what is so compelling about congregational messages in, in this day and age. And it's a reason why I think we can tell our people, you need to be church every Sunday, not just once every three weeks or four weeks or whatever that is. I've, I've gotten tired of accepting, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna show up in church every two or three, three weeks. No, I, I think you, you ought to park it in the pew every week, if, if you're able, if you're able, okay? So here's the way I've explained it. I have thoughts, feelings, urges in my head and in my heart that are terrible. Okay. I think we all do. If the things that are hidden in Dale's heart, thoughts, feelings, urges, angers, griefs, grudges, if, if all of that stuff were to be made known, I would be so 
shamed that I'd get out of town. If the stuff that's in me and it's in you, theologically we know it is, if that were laid bare, you wouldn't want to look at your spouse, your children, your co-workers, anybody again. Out of here. Now what we do as Jesus followers is stuff it. When an urge or an impulse starts to rise up and we know this is not right, we, we stuff it. And that's the right thing to do. I mean, the word of God gives us the power to stuff it. But you know it's still damnable sin. Even if you don't act on it, it is still damnable sin. And one of the things that we don't talk about enough, I think, as we, as we handle the doctrine of the scriptures, is that sooner or later, all this garbage that's down in my depth of being is going to be made public. Now, for all our sakes, I hope it is later rather than sooner. The Kavanaugh hearings, the Me Too accusations. It's a Sunday school picnic compared to what happens when Dale's secrets and your secrets are laid bare. So I hope for your sake that it happens later, but it is going to happen on the day of judgment. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 is that popular passage about the Word of God is living and active, da da da. But then verse 13 says that we're going to be naked and bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul. Foul. And I have come to realize in my own personal life, when I look down into that heart, which Oswald Chambers made the point that the, the human heart is deeper than the, the most unexplored depth of the ocean, and it's darker. When I look down on that, that there, there is nothing that I have that I can bargain with God. I'm not the guy in the front of the church. I thank thee, God, that I'm not like these other people, but I'm the guy in the back of the church. Be merciful to me, a sinner. Or like the malefactor on the cross, do you not fear God, seeing that you are in the same, you have deserved this judgment? Okay? I don't think our people are getting what it means that we are totally corrupted by sin. It just doesn't work to say Jesus died for your sins. We've got to, we've, we've got to play it out more. And I guess, I, guess, I guess the theme here in this section of the presentation is that we're talking theology. Not theology that we use to argue some point in church practice. We're talking about theology that my sorry soul depends upon. And your sorry soul depends upon getting out of this total corruption that we are in because of sin. The only way out is death. And now I'm getting into this uh, change or die. <laughs> that's, a, that's a title. First time I ever heard change or die. What's that about? When you go to visit someone that's laid out in the funeral home, you stand up there and you, you say some nice things about him or her. Now, once in a while, the person who's laid out in the funeral home is a total SOB. You're not going to say that, you know. But everybody is saying, you know, old Fred or old Dale. Oh, you know. Yeah. But you know what? That person is not sinning. They may be a, a tough person when they were alive, but that dead person is not sinning anymore. The only way that my corrupted heart I believe in Jesus, I'm going to heaven, okay, but it's still a corrupted heart. The only way that this thing is going to totally stop sinning is to be dead. Eternal death 
that's the only way to get out of this. What is baptism? It's putting my corrupted heart to death. Romans 6, we are therefore buried with Christ by baptism into death. It doesn't say baptism reminds us of Jesus dying. No, we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as he was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And then a couple verses later it says, if we have been buried with him in a death like his, if we have died with him in a death like his, we will be raised with him in a resurrection like his. This is a time warp thing. I mean, this is really a time warp. It's not like, it's no, when you were baptized, you died with Christ. Stone, cold, dead. And now, out of baptism, we come up with newness of life. We are different kind of people, and the resurrection is still to come. So change or die, what is that about? That's, that describes where we're at before baptism, you have to change. Otherwise, quote, the soul that sins, it shall die, Ezekiel 18. Well, can't do that. And God in a mysterious way, and believe me, this is mysterious, I don't get it, put me to death in baptism with Christ, I'm united to his body, and now I have optimism. I still sin. If you look at the quotations, okay, Dale, you got to really, oh man, you got to get moving. On, the quotations on page two, right in the middle, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short. It's not a past tense, which is the way for some reason, I think the King James may have translated it, for all have sinned and fallen short. No, historunti, it's a present participle of the glory of God. You believe in Jesus, you're going to heaven, you're active in the church, you're a pastor, you're whatever. We are still falling short. We still have this fatally flawed heart and being within us, but by baptism that is put to death in a mysterious way, and we have a future before us. This is the gospel. And this is, what they, this is why they say in, in our confession, this is the way the church stands or falls on this gospel of the forgiveness of my sins. There's a great book by John Barclay, Paul and the Gift, and he examines grace in Judaism and in the history of the church. And one of the points he makes, these, these are my words now, I believe that, I, be, I believe in my, my gut that there's something little bit, yeah, I'm saved by grace, but there's something about my life and the way I live that somehow merits a little favor from God. You know, I thank the God that I'm not like other people are. I'm a da-da-da-da-da. And Barclay shows that that is not what Paul meant. He calls it incongruous grace. There is nothing, 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 nothing in Dale's sorry soul that merits squat from God except his love in Jesus. We are chosen and elect. My retirement project will be the Concordia Commentary on 1 Peter, and he talks about being chosen and elect, but Peter is very clear. We are not a sect. We are the baptized, redeemed people of Christ who live in the hope of heaven, but we are not to withdraw from the world that we are in, but Peter makes it very clear we are to be active in this world that we are in. Now, Keep on moving. Here's another big opportunity that we have in our congregations. Your congregation as a mediating or bridge institution. There have been a number of negative trends over the years. Hyper-individualism. Individualism really got, got going with Luther and the Reformation, but then in the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason, it cranked up some more, and the United States in its founding for example, Thomas Jefferson, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each one of us is endowed with inalienable rights. Uh, America has been extremely focused on individual rights and privileges. And in our time, our lifetimes, that has gone on steroids. 
So you and I and the people we serve are always bumping into somebody who's an individualist and could care less about what we think, do, or say. And they're going to do it their way, you know? So here we have two conflicting trends. An increase over the decades in hyper-individualism in the United States, but at the same time, and all, and all, and all the problems that brings. Remember the incurvatus in say? Heather Show Davis, with all the problems that individualism brings, since we've pretty much become functional atheists as a culture, we look to government and business to fix our problem. If you look at the quotations, at the, toward the top of page two, Contradictory developments weakened mediating centers like congregations. Individ this is from Yuval Levin, um, obviously not a Lutheran. Individualism tends to weaken mediating power centers that stand between the individual and the nation as a whole, from families to local communities, including local governments, and religious institutions. Okay. So why has church attendance declined over the years? Well, one reason is that people do not see the congregation as serving the, uh, a very, very vital function in their lives. In their place, it strengthens individuals on the one hand and a central government on the other, since such a government is most likely to, is most able to treat individuals equally by treating them all impersonally. Big government and big business is impersonal. They'll say whatever they want to say, but Go right now and ask the Kurds if government is a personal, caring entity. For this reason, a hyper-individualist culture is likely to be governed by a hyper-centralized government, and each is likely to exacerbate the worst inclinations of the other. You have those two contradictory things going on, and a third result is written up by, is described by James Davison Hunter. He's a scholar at the University of Virginia. This is on page three, the second quotation. The state has increasingly become the incarnation of the public wheel. Its laws, policies, and procedures have become the predominant framework by which we understand collective life, its members, its leading organizations, its problems, and its issues. There are other forces that frame common life as well, most notably the ubiquitous market, talking about consumerism and the message that you're not, nothing if you don't spend. But these are not autonomous from the state but linked integrally with its extensive instrumentalities. This is the heart of politicization and it has gone so far as to affect our language, Im imagination and expectations. The language of politics and political economy comes to frame progressively more of our understanding of our common life, our common purposes, and ourselves individually and collectively. When I get up in the morning, and um, I like to do this more than my wife, but she abides me, we watch Morning Joe on MSNBC. I don't agree with a lot that's said, but I find it interesting, okay? Then we get tired of some of their opinions and we may go to Fox and Friends. And we get tired of some of their take on things and we go to the local news. What's the traffic? What's the weather gonna be? How did the Brewers and Cardinals do the other, you know, the other night? You know, and, and that's where we live. You live, you live where, you, where you live. The point of that being, the founders never intended us to be obsessed with politics. That's why you have a representative government but politics dominates our daily life and it seeps into congregational life, church life, etc. This is not the way it was intended to be set up. So people need, they need some place, let's see, that is going to help them bridge life from their individual life, I'm an individual, I have my, my, my joys, my woes, my, all, all this stuff. How do I learn how to take my individuality with all that's going on in that and then take it into the public sphere? 
Who's going to teach me how to live among people? That's the mediating role that the congregation has today, unlike in Christian America. We take, we desire to take people in, individuals, church members and others, and show them how to understand reality theologically, but then how do you live in this screwy culture that we are in? So your congregation has a great mission as a mediating institution. And it's not just Jesus died for your sins. It's that plus how does this play out as you're interacting with some of the jerks that we all have in our life to deal with? Here we have some of these opportunities. We talked about the first, interpreting reality theologically. Secondly, against hyper-individualism, we have the body of Christ. I'll tell you something about hyper-individualism and the body of Christ. One of the subtle temptations that the devil is using is when people sit in our pews and hear the scriptures read to them, they hear the pronoun you, Y-O-U, Y-O-U, and they will t most often understand that to be singular because that's Western individualism. The culture is conditioning them to hear Y-O-U as singular, but most of the time in the Bible it's not singular, it is plural, it's, it's y'all, all y'all, it's the body of Christ. And the idea of the body of Christ runs counter to the culture that is all around us and has shaped us in, in many ways in our families. But this is something, we're a body here. We're a uniquely different place in this congregation than any place else that you expect in the world. Shame, not only guilt. I'll let you look at the quotation on that, but this was pointed out to me a year or so ago. The Western church is focused on, on right and wrong, sin, guilt, and forgiveness. But that is increasingly not the way Americans think. Third world countries don't operate so much with forgiveness, but with shame and guilt. And you're seeing this show up in American life too. Shame on you, shame on you, shame on you. In preaching and in teaching, talking about shame and honor, First Peter is big on honor, is a way that we can touch the hearts of people. And if you look at the life of Christ in the Gospels, you will see that time and time again, it wasn't only guilt, but he first addressed a person's shame. Think of the woman at the well. Pluralism doesn't mean syncretism. Okay, I would I'll skip over that now. The preacher is world maker. That's a quotation from the title of an article written by one of our professors, Peter Nafsker, in the Concordia Journal a couple issues ago. And you and I, as church leaders, especially the people who stand up and, and talk, like I'm doing now, we help shape the world of the people who listen to us. This is about epistemology. You think about, you know, Joe Blow sitting in the pew, and where does he get all his information for life? It's from the media, it's from the screens, social, social media, peer pressure, and so on. And, and that shapes a lot of these functional atheists, okay? You and I are, Nasker says, the world makers. We're telling a different story, the story that helps them understand who they are in this world as followers of Jesus. I will, not, I will just race on. John Barclay says that Paul founded congregations. Barclay is a British scholar, again. Paul and the Gift, that's a wonderful work about grace. He formed um, congregations that he wanted to be qualitatively different from anything else that the people experienced in their daily life. And your congregation and mine should be the same way. I'm talking about an aspirational goal here, not a reality but our congregations should be qualitatively different from anything else that the people experience in their life. As Bethany Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas, it's been long pastored by a classmate of mine, Bill Canipa. Their, their motto is a belonging space and ascending place. 
Christian America, you didn't think about that. But our congregation should operate with different value systems, including forgiveness, honor, hope, faith in the Christ who's going to come back and take his chosen and elect, and that's plural, by the way, home. We should be a belonging space and ascending place. People will say, you know, I go to church every week because, because of what? Because I love these people. I try to go to church every week because life is tough and I need guidance and encouragement. I go to church every week because I find it intellectually stimulating, because I want peace instead of fear, shame, guilt, and anger, because I'm a steward of my new birth. I go to church each week because I want to learn about the mysteries of God, and on and on it goes. We have, uh, I wish I were younger, and serving a congregation that, that this reimagining ministry, is that what you call them, reimagining ministry? This is just a blessed time for us to be alive. Uh, I'll end with this. Those of us who are older look back over the decades and we grieve at what has been lost in our lifetimes. We grieve the losses in America. We grieve the losses in the church. I ask our students, how old were you on 9-11, 2001? Two, three, four years old. Some of them weren't born yet. The generation of leaders in the church that God is raising up are not looking back with grief. They don't have that perspective that you and I have. I can tell you from dealing intimately with students, they are looking forward with hope. They want to get out there. They understand that the ministry and our faith is about the Lord Jesus. More than we in my time crystallize that in our, in our thoughts and in, in our words. They're going to bump their heads. They're going to have their problems. What they're looking at us gray hairs to do is tell our stories about how God and how about Jesus has blessed us and helped us through our struggling way. We've got to let them have their time because they're ready to go and it's the Lord Jesus of the church who is raising young people up, not, not just seminaries, but the young people of the church up for, to quote the passage, such a time as this. It is a great time to be the church. Thank you.